All right, I think we're live. There we go. All right, well, um, today I'm doing another live stream and uh, got no one watching yet, but I guess I'll just keep talking for the sake of the people that are watching this recording later. So uh, today, the topic that I wanted to talk about, oh, hello, please clap. Always here, yeah, I see that. Today, the topic that I wanted to talk about is um, comprehensible input or input in general, because uh, there are various uh, areas of your language learning that uh, you're leaving. <laughs> yeah. Okay, goodbye. No comments about the beard and hat, I see. Um, Anyways, there are uh, there are various areas of language learning that always get talked about. There's like four quadrants, I guess you could say. There's uh, reading and writing and speaking and listening or understanding. And, um, you know, different programs, uh, you know, Pimsleur, Rosetta Stone, Duolingo, Link, all these different things, they all use different... Um, they they focus on different areas of the quadrant, different quadrants of uh, of that spectrum. Um, and today I wanted to talk about the input ones. So if you're not familiar with this concept before, um, speaking and writing are considered output because there's something that you're producing. You're choosing your own words. You're producing the words. You're choosing the things that you're going to write. Uh, you're speaking it. It's output. Reading and listening are input um, because you're kind of passively sitting there and just taking them in. You're just listening. Um, and, you know, this is a favorite area of Steve Kaufman. Uh, he always talks about comprehensible input. He always talks about uh, Stephen Krashen and, uh, and uh, the, the studies that Steve Krashen has done. Um, and it's it's slowly becoming one of my preferred areas to talk about too. Um, I'm realizing that you know the more you drill and the more you do exercises and you use flashcards and all that stuff, that can help. That can be beneficial to some extent, but you're just not gonna get to the level you want to get to without lots of input. You know, taking in lots of um, just material from native speakers that you can understand. Um, of course, I'm also a huge fan of output. So, you know, I guess in my last live stream, we kind of talked about the two camps that divide into output versus input. Steve Kaufman versus Benny Lewis, where Benny says you should start speaking from day one and speaking is the only way to actually uh, learn the language. And Steve says he doesn't start speaking until much later uh, in his language learning, um, and he just he takes in lots of input. He reads a lot, listens a lot, lots of input. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have to be an either or thing, right? You can see the value of both of those sides, the, the reading and writing versus the listening and, uh, and reading. Um, but today I just wanted to talk about um, that input portion of that, the, the reading and listening. Um, because I think it's something that I had kind of neglected for a long time in my language career. And um, it, the thing that's kind of prompting this is that uh, a few months back, like, oh gosh, probably December or something like that, I did a review on Duolingo, okay? And, you know, I give my my thoughts and uh, ideas about Duolingo. <clears throat> um, and it's become one of my more popular videos, I would say, one of my more viewed videos. And a lot of people are just talking about how great it is and, uh, you know, how they're continuing to use it. And I just want to say there's some misconceptions out there. Um, general public sees Duolingo. Right now, that's probably the the, I would say the, the most well-known language learning platform out there, uh, kind of like Rosetta Stone was, 
a few years back. Um, and everyone knows about Duolingo and it's free, which is great, you know. Um, and I'm not here to bash Duolingo because I think they do some stuff well. But I, I don't like that Duolingo is the most well-known language learning platform out there because I think it's really lacking. Um, it's just little quizzes, and that's all you do. If you think about it, it's just little quiz questions. You know, uh, translate, the cow did not eat the duck into German. <laughs> right? Uh, and I don't see that as the most effective way of learning languages. Um, and it's unfortunate because there's a lot of people out there that I feel like they think, well, if I just do Duolingo every day and if I just complete my tree, then I'll speak German, then I'll speak Russian, then I'll speak Spanish or whatever language they're learning. And honestly, I thought that too. Uh, back a few years ago, I started using Duolingo in 2013. And up until that point, the only method I had ever used for learning languages was just going to class. and. It's it's just amazing to see to think back and think about how ignorant I was because, you know, just going to class or or just using Duolingo every day is in no way sufficient for actually learning a language. It it, it you know it that's that's not even really a slice of the pie. Uh, all right, here Tofuzu says, I think Duolingo is good for jump is a good jumping off point. It gives you a decent amount of motivation when you're just starting out. I feel I don't use it a lot, but some of my friends who use it get so excited. Yeah, and that's why I'm saying it's not that Duolingo is useless. It's that you have to know how to use it and don't expect Duolingo to teach you a language. Don't expect Duolingo to make you fluent. Uh, here, uh, we have someone's nice to learn more words, but it's not enough. Yeah, exactly. I agree 100%. <clears throat> um, and so what, as I was saying, it's like Duolingo, there's these people in our society um, that are not super passionate about language learning, you know, they're not like you and I who are probably on YouTube all day long listening to polyglots speak and you know going to polyglot conferences and stuff. They're just people that have kind of a passing interest in learning Italian or, or learning Polish because the great grandma was Polish or something like that. Um, and it's a shame that the information isn't out there to educate these people that there's better ways of learning languages. Um, and like I said, or, and like uh, a few people had commented here now in the comments, thank you for your comments, by the way, like a few of us have said already, um, Duolingo is a pretty good platform for starting if you don't know anything about the language and for learning new words and stuff like that. Um, but it's in no way sufficient if you want to keep progressing and make real progress in the language. Uh, and in order to in order to do that, I think you really need to take in a lot of input. And that's what today's video is about, comprehensible input. Uh, this is a um, this is a, a concept that I first learned about in one of my linguistics classes in at university. Um, uh, here, take TK Moon says, I guess like all things with language learning, you can't stick with one method or resource. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I first learned about comprehensible inputs when I was in uh, uh, a university class about teaching English as a foreign language. So I was a student in the class, but the, stu the class was about how to become an English teacher. Um, and I think my professor had done some work with Stephen Creshen in the past, um, sometime a long time ago. Uh, and if you don't know who Stephen Creshen is, he's a linguist who works on, I think mainly on second language acquisition. And he's done a lot of studying about the ways that people learn languages, which is why he's studying second language acquisition. Um, and so if you're not familiar with this terms, Second language acquisition is the, the term of a field. 
It's like a subfield in linguistics. And there are people that just dedicate their lives to studying how adults learn languages as a second language, okay? And there's another subfield in linguistics called first language acquisition, which studies how infants learn their first language, okay? Um, but Stephen Krashen is a second language acquisition expert, and uh, his the thing that he's most well known for is uh, really pushing input, listening and reading, and especially reading. He, he wrote a whole book called uh, Free Voluntary Reading. And uh, I didn't read the book, but I read some articles that he has uh, written on the subject. And um, he says, he literally says in his articles that uh, free voluntary reading may literally be the single most effective thing that you can do to help you learn more language, or learn your language better. Uh, more effective than any other uh, strategy that you can use. And I don't know if I would go that far. Uh, I think it depends on the person and it depends on the goals for why you're trying to learn that language. Um, but I think he has a point, you know, he, uh, input and in, in reading really is super important for learning new vocabulary and making it stick. Um, he talks about, uh, oh, and, and by the way, free voluntary reading, uh, he uses this term a lot, and oh, hi Andy, nice for you to join us. Um, and Christian uses this term, uh, free voluntary reading, just to mean uh, reading that you do for fun. That's it. Not reading that's like compelled by class, not reading where you're intentionally trying to study the language in order, you know, you're not looking up every word and you're not... Uh, exerting yourself trying to you know trying to put in a ton of effort into actually learning the language he says you forget all that you just relax and you just freaking read just read that's it just for fun and then when you're bored you put the book down you know um but he says if you can do a lot of reading you're getting a lot of input you're putting a lot of words through your brain you're processing a lot of syntax he says that is probably the single most effective way of learning a language. Um, so that's what I want to talk about today: uh, the inputs that you get when you're when you're uh, learning language. And if any of you guys have any comments, suggestions, questions, anything at all, uh, please feel free to leave your comments. Um, that's why I do these live streams as opposed to just posting videos now, because I think this is way more fun. All right, TK Moon says, I've been doing that a lot recently. I thought my level was too low to understand books slash comics, but I discovered that I was able to understand like 70 to 80% of books that I've actually wanted to read. It's been so exciting. Yeah. And actually, uh, thanks for bringing up comics because um, that's also uh, an area that I've talked about before on this channel, but uh, I specifically, not just comics, but graphic novels. Here's a, a graphic novel I bought a few years ago called L'Ambulance 13. Um, and it's really nice because it's mostly pictures. And if you don't understand exactly what the words are, you can still understand what's going on just by the pictures and by the context and stuff. So um, I, you know, if you're in any way interested in this kind of book, um, that could be a huge resource for you. Um, of course, if you don't find any interest in this or if you just uh, would get super bored by graphic novels, then you're gonna have to find something that holds your interest better. Um, but, uh, and also that brings me to another thing I wanted to mention about comprehensible input. What is comprehensible input? It's input that is comprehensible to you. Um, and sometimes they say comprehensible and compelling input, which I guess those two things don't necessarily have to be exactly the same. They could, you know, you could have input that's comprehensible and not compelling, and then you could have input that's compelling and not comprehensible. 
Comprehensible just means you can understand it. It's meaningful to you. You're not just, if you're a B1 level, you're not going to go sit in and listen to, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, deliberations in Congress because you're not going to understand any of it. Okay. If you're a B1, maybe you read a children's book. Okay. One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. Um, this is what you should be reading if you're a B1. Not a B1, I meant an A1. If you don't, uh, well, if you're a B1, you've, you're probably able to understand everything in one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, or whatever it's called. Um, ideally, you want to be, under, be able to understand like 95% of what you're reading um, because if you don't understand at least at least 90% of what you're reading, it's not gonna be enjoyable and it's gonna be hard and it's gonna be work. Um, I don't know precisely what the range is. I've heard 95%, I've heard 98%, you should be able to understand 98% of the words. Um, that seems pretty high to me. Uh, if, you, if you don't know only 2% of the words that you're reading, then it seems like you're not learning a whole lot. Um, but then again, well, I don't know. I guess it's complicated. And there probably is a range in there. Like I've recommended before uh, input where you understand 70% of the words. And now looking back, I think that's pretty low. Uh, because if you, don't, if you only understand 70% of the words, that's a lot of stuff that you're missing. Um, I would say 90 to 95%, 98%, I guess, uh, can really be beneficial for, um, for the input that you're taking in. So that's comprehensible input. You can understand it, or at least you can understand most of it, almost all of it. It should be comprehensible so that you're not just lost in the sauce. Okay, it's in the sauce. <laughs> um, if you are a brand new beginner, don't go and turn on the Spanish channel. Okay, I used to do, I did that when I was in eighth grade. I didn't know. I took one Spanish class and I thought, hey, I'm going to try watching the Spanish channel, Telemundo. And I didn't understand anything. You were just lost. It doesn't make sense. It's not enjoyable. Uh, and you're not learning anything. So it's a lose, lose, lose situation. That's comprehensible input. Compelling input is things that are interesting to you. So if you're really, I was, for whatever reason, just super interested in World War I at the time. So that's why I bought L'Ambulance 13, because I wanted to read about World War I. And, you know, um, it's interesting. Look, there's, uh, I don't know, a lot of pictures to make it comprehensible, because even if I don't understand all the words, then I can at least take in... Uh, what's going on because of the pictures. So it's comprehensible and it's compelling because it's something that's interesting to me. Um, for those of you who are nerds like me, maybe graphic novels are gonna be more comprehensible than other types of book. Books, sorry. Put that plural marker on there. I do speak English as my native language. Oh gosh, all right. <clears throat> so I don't wanna talk more about that, but I'm gonna listen to some questions and comments real quick. Okay, Duolingo is good if you want to learn El Gato Baby Leche, yeah. And some, not only that, and some like really ridiculous phrases like uh, El Gato no come la vaca. Uh, all right, I guess like all things with language learning, you can't stick to one method. Okay, I guess I already did this. I've been doing that a lot recently. I thought my level was too low to understand books and comments. Okay, I already read that one. I guess, where am I? <clears throat> okay, I do some input, reading and or listening. This is from Andy. I do some input, reading and or listening at all levels of learning, but mostly I do it after I reach the B1 conversational level. Yeah, so, well, that's the debate, right? Benny says you should start speaking from day one. And uh, Steve says you should start reading from day one, you, I don't know, you, I've never heard him use that phrase, but he said, just start with comprehensible input. And he says he doesn't start speaking until much later in his language learning. Um, 
I don't I like to do both. I definitely start speaking and doing output right away as soon as I can. Uh, but, you know, if you can start with uh, things that are pretty comprehensible like this, um, I don't know. To me, I actually, strangely, I'm 28 years old and I, for some reason, still really like Dr. Seuss books. These are like really, he's just really clever, you know, and really funny. Let me see if I have. Uh, no, I don't have it here, but Fox and Socks, I think that's what it's called, Fox and Socks. That's like a really funny book, even though, <laughs> you know, it was designed for someone that's 25 years younger than me. Um, but I don't know, I still find it interesting. Um, and not to mention, pretty much when you start a new language, it's exciting, it's fun. So pretty much anything you do in that language is going to be compelling. Uh, it's not until you get later on and you've, you know, the novelty starts to wear off that uh, learning the language starts to become more of a drag and you got to find more exciting ways to do it. Um, but yeah, there's certainly input methods that you can do from early on, from A1. You know, um, on Link, they do these mini stories. Um, it, it, just just short, very basic stories with with. Uh, extremely basic vocabulary, not in any way complex grammar. Um, and you can just listen to them a bunch of times. Steve says he listens to them like 20 to 30 times. You can read them over and over. And um, so there are certainly ways that you can start using input right away. Um, maybe not right away. I, I should clarify that. I started learning Dutch this summer just not that I was really interested in actually learning Dutch, but I was going to the Netherlands and Belgium for a weekend. So I thought, yeah, I'll put in a few days just to learn some basic Dutch. And I tried doing it on Link and it was a little overwhelming. Uh, you know, you're just, you're looking at all these blue words and you're like, all right, well, I don't know any of them. So I can't really progress to the next page. Um, you know, and so you turn all of your blue words into yellow words and then you go to the next page and it, it was just a lot. So that's where I think Duolingo kind of outshines Link. Um, but after a week, two weeks, maybe a month tops, you should be able to start doing some, uh, very basic input in your language. All right. What else we got here? Uh, when I first start a language, usually the only thing I can read and listen to is the dialogues and beginner textbooks. Uh, I'm not interested in graphic novels, comics for some reason. Some people aren't. And, you know, uh, if that's you, then you got to find something else that's interesting to you. Like I said earlier, even if you're not naturally interested in graphic novels and comics and stuff, um, if you're doing it in your language, in your target language, that can add a little bit of, uh, of interest to you. So, you know, uh, wouldn't hurt to at least try it and see if you can enjoy it just from the aspect of learning your language, even if you're not natu naturally interested in that kind of stuff. All right. Uh, I don't know how to say your name. I'm sorry. Jadila, Jadela, uh, Nascimento says, I like this idea. I have never thought about reading this kind of book. Yeah. Uh, I assume you're talking about the the graphic novels, and they're super fun for me to read. I guess it makes it way easier and uh, just more interesting. And then Andy says the idea of being near 100% is because you can learn new words from context. I guess I'm not sure were we talking about 100%. Oh, oh yeah, I gotcha, I gotcha. Yeah, so I assume you're talking about when uh, when you should be able to understand almost 100% of the input that you're taking in. And you say the idea of it being near 100% is because you can learn new words from context. If it's too low, there are uh, too many unknown words to guess most of them from context. That's the theory. Also, Professor Argelis, I don't know how to pronounce that, says if it's uh, not 90-something percent, I forgot his exact percentile. 
uh, you, you'll only get the gist of what you're reading and you won't enjoy the author's choice of words. Yeah, so, um, let me see, I have this book right here. Number of the Stars, actually, oh, here it is. I have it in English and in French. Contre les étoiles. Um, yeah, so, from my perspective, I'm a nerd, okay? I'm an autodidact. I like learning. I, I like doing puzzles, okay? Um, and I like learning languages. So this is a children's book, but when I was reading this book, and I read, you know, it's, it's not a, a super small book. Um, it's not super long, but uh, for someone who's learning a language, and when I started reading this book, I, my level of French wasn't great. It was okay. Um, but it was a little bit overwhelming to, to read this book, even though it's uh, for children, um, because I definitely didn't know 90% of the words that I was reading. But for someone like me who enjoys challenging, I don't know, what you, you know, like brain challenges, okay, puzzles, uh, stuff like that. It really was kind of fun to try to work my way through the book and challenge myself. It wasn't like a relaxing read, okay? It's not something that I could just sit down and enjoy by the fireplace and, and then relax and go to bed. It was like, if you really enjoy doing Sudoku or, you know, I don't know, crossword puzzles or something like that, and they're and you've done all the easy ones, so now you move on to the really hard, challenging ones. Uh, that's what reading this book was like to me. Um, of course, that is not what Krashen would call free voluntary reading. That's, oh, I guess I should explain this distinction too. There is, um, uh, in second language acquisition, they have what, there's this distinction between uh, Intensive reading and extensive reading, okay? Intensive reading is kind of just what it sounds like. It's really intense. You're, you're going to go through this book where uh, a lot of stuff doesn't make sense, and you're just going to study it. You're going to figure out what it says. You're going to look up the words. You're going to uh, study the syntax. You're going to study the grammar, and you're going to make sense of it, and you're going to study it, okay? It's intense. Extensive reading is more what I have done with books like Le Petit Prince, um, where you're just reading the book just because you enjoy it. And you're just flipping through the book. You're just reading. You're having a good time. And that's why it's called extensive reading, because you're going to do a lot of reading. With intensive reading, you're going to you know, maybe read one page max, but you're going to understand that page really well. With extensive reading, you're going to read a lot of pages, and you're not going to worry about understanding everything. You're not going to look up words. You're not going to uh, look up idiomatic expressions and syntax and, and stuff. Hello, Rasmus A. Nice of you to join us. You're just going to read a lot, okay? And you're going to try to have fun and just enjoy yourself and relax while you're reading. That's extensive reading. And there's values to both of these things, okay? Um I forgot what the question was or why I got on the subject. Um, okay. Yeah, you'll only get the gist of why you're reading and you won't enjoy the author's words. Yeah, so anyways, uh, the reason I, I go into this tangent is because try, experiment with both. Try both. If you're learning a language, you should be trying a bunch of different methods anyways. Um, try reading a... a, a story or uh, a page, an article on Wikipedia, that's too challenging for you, okay? Uh, try reading things where you only understand a small portion, not a small portion, you only understand 70, 80% of what you're reading and look up the words, okay? Or do it on link and just, you know, it's easy because you can just tap the words and figure out what they're saying. Um, but don't just do that. Because if that's the only way you read, you're missing out on a valuable opportunity to do extensive reading where you're just getting lots of input, lots of words. You're seeing lots of uh, new vocabulary. You're getting repetitions. It's like it's like memorize. It's like spaced repetition systems. 
um, where you're getting tons of exposure to the same words, the same syntactic patterns. Um, and that's reinforcing it in your mind because you're getting uh, uh, lots of repetitions in context, not out of context like you do in, uh, in, in Memorize and Anki and stuff. All right. Marina de Argentina says, sorry, I guess that would be Marina de Argentina. Uh, a lot of Polish and Russian learn Spanish watching telenovelas. Yeah. Um, like I said, uh, I, when I was in eighth grade, started watching uh, Telemundo and Univision uh, on, I, you know, the Spanish channel. And I had taken one Spanish class, or I guess I was in the course of taking my first Spanish class when I was in eighth grade. And I thought, you know, I've had four months of learning Spanish. I should be able to go on and understand some of what they're saying on the Spanish channel. And of course, I understood nothing. <clears throat> First of all, because in Spanish class, they don't actually teach you the way people actually speak in real life, which I think is a problem. Uh, and second of all, because I just wasn't at that level yet. It needs to be comprehensible input and c compelling input in order for this to be effective. Um, because if you just jump into the deep end and you're just swimming in this sea of words that you don't understand, they're not comprehensible to you, you're not learning anything, okay? If there's one word in the sea of words that you don't understand, it, 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 most of the words you do understand and one word in that is a word that you don't understand, you can usually figure out what that word meant, okay? But if every word is something that you don't understand, then you're just looking at ju just a massive pile of things that you don't make any sense to you. Um, so it's not gonna help. It's not gonna do any good. All right, uh, Rasmus A says, there are some people saying reading before a large input of audio is going to hurt chances of having a good pronunciation and accent. Do you agree with that? Um, reading can hurt your pronunciation, for sure. Like, I, I can guarantee that. Reading can hurt your pronunciation. Um, I don't know if it's big enough to worry about, okay? This part of the reason why I really like Pimsleur, because Pimsleur is entirely audio, and you don't have the words and the letters in front of you to mess up your perception, your perception of what you're hearing. So, um, so for example, uh, well, I started learning French um, two, just over two years ago now. It was summer of 2016. And I didn't actually really start learning French at that time. What I started doing was listening to French music. Um, and the first song that I really started listening to in French was called La Mer by Charles Trenet. Um, and I remember very clearly listening to the song a lot, just over and over and over on repeats because uh, well, at that time, I wasn't even sure that I wanted to learn French, but I thought if at some point in the future I do start learning French, then I'll have this as kind of a basis to go off of. And so what I started doing was listening to the song over and over and over without any idea of what it was saying and no idea how the words were spelt. Um, after about, I don't know, I'd say a few weeks, maybe a month of listening to this song, I went and looked up the words online and the spelling of these words to the song were in no way similar to what I would have expected, right? You know how French spelling is. It, the last four letters of the word are always silent. And you're like, why does this word end with E-A-O-U? But, it, but its pronunciation is O, right? Or or um, I don't know. There's just a ton of words in French that I'm kind of drawing a blank now. Pretty much any consonant that ends at the end of a word is not going to be pronounced. 
Um, and so because I had listened to the song so much beforehand, I already knew how the words were supposed to be pronounced. I didn't know what the words meant. And I certainly didn't know how they were spelled, but I knew how they were supposed to be pronounced. So when I went and started learning, reading the words, uh, I think it was a little easier to get closer to the proper pronunciation. Um, and I've had, I've had a lot of people compliment my pronunciation in French. Um, and I think they're probably exaggerating because I don't think my French pronunciation is that great. Uh, but I chalk up, I chalk it up to listening to a lot of music and Pimsleur. Okay. Those are the two methods that I think have really helped my pronunciation. In fact, there was one time in, in, uh, I go to this like French club at my school. It's not a class, but it's like a, uh, it's just a club where you can go speak French with people. And one of the teachers at the school is actually from French and he was there speaking to us. And there was a, a group of us, like the more advanced classes, like the 300 level, uh, or students from the 300 level classes were there talking in the corner with this professor from France. And he literally, he pointed at me and he said, you could pass for French. He looks at the rest of them and he goes, you guys, not so much. And I was very flattered that he said that because I think he was exaggerating. I can't pass as a French guy, but, um, you know, I, I chalk it up to, for some reason he singled me out as opposed to the rest of them. And I think it's because I listened to Pimsler so much and because I just listened to music constantly. And when I listen to music, I sing along and I don't sing the lyrics, how I think the words are supposed to be pronounced. Um, if that makes sense, I so these days I do read the lyrics, but I don't read the lyrics and then pronounce the lyrics the way I think that word is supposed to be pronounced. I listen to the singer and I listen to exactly what the singer does, and then I try to recreate that, regardless of how the word is spelt. Um, and I think that has been a big help because you know, you get a lot of American speakers, especially in class. You know, I, I'm sitting in class with these people and I'm like, do you hear how American you sound? That doesn't even, um, at least try to make it sound like French. You know, you're not even like, I understand French R is hard to do sometimes, but uh, it it's not in any way similar to the er sound of English. You know, I, I would say a G sound G would be closer to the French R or an H sound. Um, okay, sorry, I'm missing a lot of uh, questions here. Okay, da -da 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 -da. Um, there's some people saying reading. Oh yeah, that was the question. And then, uh, hey, um, okay, I start with audio courses, Pimsleur, Mitchell Thomas, etc. Too. That's part of the reason I put off. Uh, much input until later. These kinds of courses teach me basic grammar and vocabulary. Yep. Pimsleur is great. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of the translation method, which is, you know, part of the reason why I think Duolingo struggles a lot. Uh, but for me, Pimsleur, I would say, is one of the most useful. After, now, nowadays, I would say Link is my favorite language learning thing, but after Link, Pimsleur would probably be the second. I, I, I really enjoy Pimsleur. Um, and I'm going to be using Pimsleur from now on whenever I start a new language. I think I've gotten past the point now where it's useful for me in French because, uh, well, I followed Pimsleur up to French 5. And even when I was doing French 5, I was like, okay, this is too basic for me. But Pimsleur is great. They teach you, you know, you start from the very beginning. So if you don't know a single word in the language, you can learn using Pimsleur. <clears throat> um, they teach you basic grammar, they teach you vocabulary. Most importantly, they teach you the pronunciation without the spelling, so that the spelling doesn't get in the way. Now, of course, they don't teach you spelling, and spelling and, and writing are a portion of language learning, okay? So uh, it's not the perfect all-encompassing language learning platform, but I find it to be very useful. And yes, like Andy said, um, it's good to start out with this kind of stuff. Um, 
before you go to the reading and writing uh, because that will help your pronunciation. Now, um, I'm not saying that's what everyone needs to do. Like I usually say, uh, Duolingo seems to be pretty good for the purposes of starting your language um, because it's just, it's just basic and it's structured and they, they give you all the, all the basics that you need to know to build the foundation off of. Um, so you have to figure out what you want to do. Do I want to have really good pronunciation? If so, then yeah, I would recommend probably not starting off with Duolingo uh, until later and just doing audio because you want to tune your ear to the way the language sounds before you start messing it up with the, the letters and the spelling and then strange orthography things. Okay. And, and he says, then the input is easier after I complete courses like those. Yeah, I agree. All right, Ryan Mitchell, Mitchell, Michael says, do you like French or Spanish more if you had to choose? Um, well, I don't know what you mean by like. Um, I would say right now, since I'm more actively learning French, it's more interesting to me than Spanish. Uh, Spanish is way more useful in the United States, like way more useful. It's not even a competition. It, you know, it's funny there. So I'm not going to judge anyone for your language choices. If you decide you want to start learning Urdu, then cool. But I always find it funny when people in the United States take German classes or French classes or Chinese classes or something like we're mandated, we're mandated to take foreign language classes in high school. And I'm like, when do you ever need to use German in the United States? Like never. Now, granted, if your family is German or if you go to Germany a lot for some reason, then that's a logical choice. But, um, you know, it seems to me like the only you could get. Well, first of all, you could just not learn any languages and get by just fine living in the United States. It wouldn't even be an issue ever uh, for most people. Second of all, if you were going to learn a language, then it seems like Spanish is by far the most logical choice because you occasionally run into people that speak Spanish but not English. Um, and you never, at least where I live, maybe if you lived in like northern Vermont or something, but in Wisconsin where I live, you never run into someone that speaks French and not English or German and not English. Uh, maybe sometimes you go to like a Chinese restaurant and the waitress or the, the hostess doesn't really speak English that well. Um, but that's just my opinion. Um, and to be clear, I'm not judging anyone for their language choice. Like if you want to learn French just because you think French is a more beautiful language, then that, then learn French, uh, but it's certainly not as useful as Spanish and where I live. Um, but of course, like I always say, yeah, here, Ryan, he says, didn't you learn Esperanto? Yeah, yeah, I did because I wanted to learn Esperanto. Um, I'm not in any way saying that Esperanto is a more useful language than Spanish. It's definitely not, <laughs> um, but I did it because I wanted to, I thought it was fun. So again, okay, that was not a roast. Uh, I never claimed that you can't learn a language because it's not useful. Uh, I was just stating which language I find to be more useful where I live. And of course, if you live in Europe or somewhere, then uh, you know other languages are going to be much more useful. Um, I was only talking about where I live. All right, getting back to the topic at hand, input, comprehensible input, compelling input. <clears throat> Let me read some more of these comments, questions. Okay, original course by Mike, Michael Thomas. Is it Mitchell Thomas? Uh, by himself are not so good for pronunciation, I would say. But I love active learning and playing with words and making a lot of sentence. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not really familiar with this. I guess I'll have to look into it. My, Mitchell Thomas or Michael Thomas? How do you pronounce that? Is it Mitchell or Michael? 
<clears throat> All right. What else we got here? It's not a method, but rather a massive, massive input, I would say. All right, I guess we got basically to the end of the comments here. Uh, yeah, so anyways, okay, it's more like Michelle. It's pronounced like Michelle. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, is that is that a French name? Michel? Michel Thomas? I'm going to have to look this up. Hold on. I guess I can look it up later. <laughs> um, it's pronounced like Michelle. Yeah. All right. So French. Gotcha. So I guess I basically talked about everything I want to talk about, but I still got some time to hang out. If you guys have more questions or anything um, specifically about learning languages with inputs, but I guess if you have other questions too, that's fine. Here, um, we have a comment that says, for me, taking classes that aren't specifically designed to learn a language are really useful. E.g., I took a course on Spanish literature that I used to improve my Spanish, but that wasn't the course. That wasn't the course's main goal. Yeah, I agree. In fact, I'm, I'm taking two courses right now at university. Um, well, I'm taking a bunch of courses, but I'm taking two French courses right now. One is uh, French cinema, and the other is uh, reading French texts. So I find those to be very useful. Um, even though these are not classes designed to teach you the language, but you're just getting more input. You're listening a lot. My, my professor, I have the same professor for both classes, and he's a native speaker of French, which is great, because you're getting in a lot of input. Uh, you know, listening a lot, you're reading a lot, it's great. Uh, way more useful for trying to become a well-rounded speaker of the language than just doing exercises and trying to perfect your grammar. <clears throat> All right, you should listen to Lay Better, how do you say that, Better, Better Raves? Lay Better Raves, super good band. Is that a French band? Not familiar with that. All right. And then we have a comment that says, I'd love to find an extended version of Glossica as an input. Those bilingual mass sentences help me a lot. Yeah, I've seen Glossica before. I follow them on, on Twitter, but never used the, the platform. I'm not really familiar how they go. All right, Matthew says, uh, have you been exposed to a Quebec accent? I've heard friends from the U.S. complaining that their French sounded too different and they had a hard time to understand it. Yeah, actually, just yesterday, wait, what's today? Friday, right? Yeah, ju so just yesterday, Thursday afternoon in class, uh, in my French cinema class, there's actually um, a bunch of native speakers from France. Like, I would say at least 50% of the class is native speakers from France. And, and I know the question I always get is, why would native speakers take, take a French class? It's because it's, it's not a class designed to teach you a language. It's, it's a French cinema class, okay? And I guess all the French students, all the foreign exchange students or the, the, the international students from France, uh, you know, they come to UW-Milwaukee and then they think, oh, I can get an easy A by taking a class where we just watch movies. So there's a ton of native speakers of French in my French class. And two of them were sitting next to me and they, you know, one of them looks at me before class started, we were just talking and he goes, how long did you live in Quebec? And I said, what? I never lived in Quebec. He goes, but you have a Quebec accent. And at that moment I was like, yes. I mean, it's better than him saying I have an American accent. Um, so, yeah. It, it, so I don't, I've never been mistaken for um, a native speaker of French, but <laughs> uh, it, it was kind of nice to have him say, "You have 
a Quebecois accent rather than just saying you sound like some American that's struggling to learn English, uh, specifically since the Quebecois accent is the accent that I would rather learn because um, I go to Quebec way more than I go to France. So that was just an interesting story. I And I, I chuck that up too because I listen to Quebecois music all the time. Uh, and, and also, you know, going to Quebec and making friends with them, but it's input, see? That's what I've been saying. It's the input, listening to music. Um, and also, I guess when I when I listen to Pimsler and stuff like that, or when I re if I read something out loud, I usually try to, I guess the Quebecois my accent is just more natural to me now, I guess I would say. Do, 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 do. Okay. Um, book two is a free resource, which is a little bit like Glossica, but without the space repetition, there are 2000 items, sometimes words or phrases, but usually sentences for each language. That's interesting. It's called Book Two. I'm gonna look this up real quick. Book Two. Learn 50 languages online for free. Huh, interesting. Thanks for that little tidbit. I'm not gonna take time to look it up now, but I'll look it up later. Thanks, Andy. All right, um, I hear that there's a method for training brain and ears, but it's too expensive to even try called Tomatis, tomatis. Uh, some say it can be used for training ears to a native level, but one thousand dollars is too much. Yeah, I, I agree. That's a lot. Um, and also, I'm very skeptical of anything that says you can train yourself to a native level using their program. Um, Language learning programs don't get you to a native level. You'll never do Duolingo enough to get to a native level. You just have to speak with people. It, first of all, it's very rare for an adult to learn a language to native level. Um, I guess you can do it. You can never quite get rid of your accent completely. A lot of people think you can, but you can't. Um, I, I think you can basically get to native level with other with your grammar and your your interactions and stuff uh, but it's very difficult and very rare um and so for for a program that is selling their product to say we'll get you to a native level that just sounds like false advertising to me even having never had any experience with their program uh, i don't know i i wouldn't trust it it may be a very good program. I don't know. Uh, but I agree for a thousand dollars. That's too much. $10,000. That's insane. All right. Uh, Matthew says, do you go on holiday to Quebec a lot? So you probably picked up their accent. Yeah. Uh, I go to Quebec like maybe twice a year or something. I love it there. It's my favorite place. Oh, sorry. Earthquake. Um, all right. Um, Okay, what do you think? What do you think of Steve Kaufman's French accent? Well, Steve speaks French better than I do. Um, he has more of a metropolitan French accent. I, I I'm not super good at at pinpointing where accents are from, but um, well, I, he has a Canadian accent, I guess, <laughs> like a an Anglophone Canadian accent. Um, as far as I'm aware, but he does, he speaks French very well. Um, and it's strange to me that, you know, being a Canadian, he wanted to learn European French, metropolitan French. But actually, I think that is kind of a thing in Canada, right? Like even in the Anglophone provinces, even though they're required to learn French in school, they're usually taught French from, from France, which I... I don't know. Does, I mean, also French and English are very like political in in Canada, um, which is strange for an American to think about. Like, you're gonna why is there so much tension over what language you speak? I don't know. I don't fully understand it, but um, I don't know. I guess I don't have a whole lot to say about that. Anyways, Steve speaks French well. He speaks a lot better than me. 
Um, so I can't really say too much about his accent. All right. Uh, here we have, he says, yeah, book two is good, but it is only till level A for 50 languages. Eh. But it's still something that would be interesting. Uh, I'm going to, I'm definitely going to check. I have it bookmarked here, so I'm going to check it out when we're done with this video. All right. Uh, and he says, in book two, select the language you're learning from first and Oh, the language you're learning from first, and then the target language on the second screen. It's useful for laddering too. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna check that out. Have you ever have you ever attempted and failed to learn a language? Yeah, Greek. Um, this was before I really got into language learning. So I've talked about this in previous videos, but <clears throat> um, started learning Spanish when I was in like eighth grade, uh, just sitting in class, you know. Uh, and then I continued taking classes throughout high school, which, as everyone knows, doesn't really help. That's not how you learn language. You don't learn languages in class. You learn it in dans la vie, uh, I guess. <laughs> um, but while I was in high school, I also started kind of meddling in ancient Greek. Um, but I was just not equipped with the right strategies for learning languages. I thought the way you learn a language is by going to class and doing your homework, right? And so when I was trying to learn Greek, I was trying to be disciplined enough to do exercises every day. And it's useless. That's not how you learn languages. Um, also, after I graduated from high school, while I was in the Marine Corps, I, you know, I was working full time, not going to school, but I thought, hey, in my free time, I'll, I'll um, try to spend some time learning Greek, and I'll also practice Spanish on Duolingo because that's how you improve in your language. You know, just very ignorant, and um, I don't know. Uh, didn't have the right methods for learning languages, which is why I failed. Um, I. I've never given up my dream, I guess you would say, of learning Greek. I still, that's just a language that's interesting to me. And someday I probably will start learning ancient Greek. Uh, and when that happens, I will succeed because now I understand how to learn. Um, of course, ancient Greek will be different than any of the other languages I'm currently learning. Um, because it's not spoken by anybody natively, as far as I'm aware. Uh, and it's going to require a lot more reading than listening. Well, I won't require any listening, actually. Um, so I'm going to have to modify my methods a little bit. But yeah, I'm confident that by the time I start learning ancient Greek, I will be ready to succeed, as opposed to when I was just so young and naive and I thought that exercises were the way to learn languages. All right. Um, da -da -da -da. Um, okay. Besides I have, I have, or I so much love the frequency dictionaries of Rutledge. I'm not familiar with that. Rutledge. Um, it helps me decide which words to learn first. Uh, yeah, I'm not really familiar with what that is. So if you want to leave a clarifying comment below, below, um, that would help. Okay. Marina says, I don't want to get rid of my accent. Mm. You're like your accent in your native language or your accent in your target language. Cause I don't think you're really in danger of learning your, uh, of losing your accent in, I assume your native language is Spanish, um, if you're from Argentina. Uh, but if you, for some reason, want to keep your accent in your target language, that's cool, I guess, uh, if you think that's part of your identity. You know, actually, I think there's a lot of, like, this is interesting. There's a lot of, like, foreigners that come to the United States and become movie stars and stuff, like, I don't know, Arnold Schwarzenegger and... The Chinese guy from The Hangover, uh, and maybe the woman from from uh, what's that 
TV show called Modern Family. The Spanish lady, the, not the Spanish, I don't know what country she's from, Hispanic lady. Um, and I, I don't know about those three specifically, but I'm just thinking of like foreigners that come and become movie stars who a lot of them, I think, speak English very well, but they keep their accent and their, you know, their, their, um, their grammatical errors and stuff because it's like their trademark now, right? If Arnold Schwarzenegger just started speaking like a normal, normal American, uh, I don't know, it would kind of change your perspective of him in some way uh, because you're so used to him saying, get to the chopper, uh, I'll be back, right? Um, and I'm not saying he's faking, I don't know. Uh, but I imagine some of them are probably kind of putting on more of a show than, it's like Larry the Cable Guy. Okay, you ever watch Larry the Cable Guy? There's no way he actually talks like that in real life. <laughs> like he goes home and, and sounds like, I don't know, I was about to do an accent of him, but I, <laughs> or, 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 an impression of him, but uh, that would have just failed. So anyways, I digress. Uh, Ryan Michael says, just learn modern Greek, silly. Um, and I don't know, modern Greek is just not as interesting to me. Although I hear they are very similar. Like, even though modern Greek and ancient Greek are separated by like thousands of years, they're more similar than, than modern English and, and old English, which are only separated by like less than a millennium. Um, but ancient Greek is more interesting to me than modern Greek. <clears throat> and again, it's not about, it's not about what language is most useful. It's about the language that I want to learn. <clears throat> All right. Matthew says, uh, in European schools, we're taught British English. But most of us like to watch movies and series from the U.S., so we all end up speaking in an awkward mix of British and American accents. Yeah. It's funny, you know, for a long time, I thought, I thought Germans were incapable of pronouncing R's for some reason. Not incapable, but I thought that was just a, a, a feature of the German accent where you just don't pronounce R's at the end of the words. Um, like Arnold Schwarzenegger, get to the choppa, right? I thought that that, that choppa, I thought that was like a, a, an artifact of the German accent. And then somewhere along the line, I kind of realized it's not that Germans can't pronounce R's. I mean, they have an R. In, I, I don't speak German, but I, my understanding is that there is an R in German that's closer to the French R, right? Um, so maybe Amer maybe American R's are just difficult for German speakers, but um, somewhere along the line, I realized they're probably not doing that because of anything in the French in the in the German language. They're doing it because that's how they're taught to pronounce "chapa," right? Because that's how you would pronounce it in Britain. You know, you, you can imagine uh, some proper English guy sipping his tea saying, get to the chopper after my tea and crumpets. That was my, that was my impression of a British guy. I hope no English people are watching this. <laughs> Fish and chips, I do say. All right. Um, so then uh, let's see. Matt, I'm probably got... On Polyglot Progress channel is learning ancient Greek now. Check out his recent view or video on the subject. That is uh, a good tidbit. I do watch Poly Polyglot Progress on occasion, uh, but I wasn't aware he's learning ancient Greek. Although these people are learning a lot of languages, right? Like I don't remember. I mean, I, I know Abigail is learning like Bulgarian or something. Um, I mean, which again, I, <laughs> again, I don't want to sound like I'm judging people for their language choices because I don't care. If you want to learn a language, I say go for it. But it seems like they're learning a lot of like strange languages. Not that the languages are strange, but just uh, 
things that you don't normally hear people wanting to learn, which is fine. Just an observation. Um, but I will check out his video now that you say that. Actually, I'm going to make myself a note right here. Okay, man. Remember that. Just remember that. Oops. Just remember that. Okay. All right. Um, Rulage is a major foreign language reference book pu publisher in Europe. Their grammar reference books are popular among polyglots in Europe. Ah, okay. Didn't know that. All right. Marina says you can watch Luisito around the world. He has strong accents, but he is easy to understand. Not sure what Luisito is. Is that a TV show, I assume? You can watch Luisito, she says. Okay. He's easy to understand. Where is he from? No. Oh. All right. And then frequency dictionaries consist of the 5,000 most frequent words used in a language. It's useful because I feel like it's not okay when I learn the word roundabouts in Spanish as an A2 level learner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, actually, now now that you mentioned this, I I um I have not up here. I guess I have this book downstairs, but I have one of those. It's the one thousand most common words in ancient Greek. Um, and I found that to be very useful. And in fact, uh, one of the few things I think I did right when I started learning ancient Greek was that I used this book to learn the most, the 1,000 most common words in ancient Greek. Um, I didn't go about the most effective way of learning those words, but at least I used this book to, to choose the right words that I should have been learning. Um, so I find that to be useful. Yeah, you want to be learning common words before you start learning how to say roundabout. I agree completely. Do, 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 do. Okay. Uh, Marina de Argentina, Luisito's accent is just too bland for me, and I don't know why. Okay. Um, Ryan says, a lot of the polyglots follow the saying, jack of all trades, master of none. Right. So, I don't particularly like languages someone speaks. Um, and I assume by this comment, what you mean is if you try to learn too many languages, you'll never learn any of them. All right. And that's true to an extent. Like the more languages you decide to learn, the, the less progress you'll be able to make in any given one of them. And what I always say is that's not necessarily a bad thing. If you prefer to learn more languages to a lesser extent, then do that. If that's what is fulfilling to you, and I always talk about Mozik. I think it, I think his name is Mozik Mo, Moses McCormick, who is um, he's from Ohio, I think, polyglot from Ohio. His username or his YouTube name is like Lowashu five hundred and five thousand or something like that. Five zero five zero zero zero. Is that five hundred and five thousand? Yeah. Um, and he's, I've watched videos of him. Like he has these charts of which languages he's learning and there's like 50 of them and it's insane. And then you watch the video like where he has a hidden camera in his hat and he goes to the mall and he just speaks to everyone he sees and he speaks to them in Wolof, Urdu, Cantonese, Mandarin, Albanian, Bulgarian. And you're like, how does he know all these languages? And it's because he's not worried about mastering any of them. And if that's the case, then you're fine. You're golden. If you just want to go to the mall and have a conversation with, or try to have a conversation with someone in the mall. And he does subtitles on a lot of his videos. So it's funny because a lot of them are just like, he says hello in their language. And then they say something that, he may or may not understand. And then he says, like, I am learning language X in that language. 
And like, that's about the extent of the conversation a lot of times, or like, you can see that he's really struggling to figure out how to say the words. Um, but clearly he enjoys it. So if that's what he finds fulfilling, then awesome. I think it's great. <sighs> All right. But yes, going back to the actual comments, Jack of all trades, master of none. The more languages you want to learn, the less time and effort you're going to be able to put into each individual one of them. It's true, but not necessarily a bad thing. <clears throat> all right. Uh, I learn languages for practical, practical purposes, which is immigration. It always amazes me that so many people are learning languages just for fun with no intention of living in any of those countries. Yep. Uh, so in your case, uh, you have a very strong reason for wanting to actually learn the language well, and that's your motivation and, you know, good. That's what you should be doing. Uh, other people, you know, I'm learning Esperanto, not because I have some end goal of immigrating to Esperanto land because it's fun. Uh, all right. I usually fall in love with the language's aesthetics. That's why I learned some of them. Russian, Swahili, Korean, etc. Yeah. Um, I've never particularly found one language more, aesthetic, more aesthetically pleasing than others. I guess I can kind of see it. I, like, if anything, I would actually disagree with you. I don't think Russian sounds particularly aesthetically pleasing. Um, I know people say French is really aesthetically pleasing. They probably don't use that term. They say French sounds really beautiful. It's a beautiful language. I don't know. I don't particularly find languages beautiful. I actually do really enjoy the Quebecois accent, not because I think it sounds beautiful, but just because it, I don't know. Sounds fun to me. When I hear someone speaking Quebecois French, I think that is a fun person. It's like the Irish accent. I I just hear them speaking it and I think, oh man, you gotta be a crazy, crazy man. <laughs> like, I bet you we'd have a lot of fun together. <laughs> Go do something crazy. <laughs> I don't know why I think that, it just sounds fun. And for, for whatever reason, the Quebecois accent seems to me like that is to French what the Irish accent is to English. I don't know why. It's just, I don't know, some strange thing going on in my brain. So I'm out of comments. I'm out of questions to comment on here. Oh, did someone leave another one? No, that was just my imagination. Um, but anyways, this was originally a video on input, comprehensible input and compelling input. Uh, if we have any more questions or comments or debate topics on that issue, then I'm very happy to take them. Got plenty of time here. Got nothing going on this afternoon. Or if we just want to have more discussion discussion amongst yourselves in the comment section. Um, let's see, do I have anything else in here that I want to comment on? This was, so when I first was just really getting into language learning as a subject in itself. So, you know, I had been learning Spanish for several years, like started learning Spanish in 2004 took my first Spanish class, but I learned Spanish for like over 10 years without really getting an interest in language learning itself. Like I, I would say language learning with a capital L, right? Cause you can study language learning without studying the, the language itself, right? I spend more time on YouTube studying how to learn languages than I do how to learn French. Okay, uh, so if that makes sense, that's that's what I'm getting at here. Uh, so I had been studying, when I lived in El Salvador, I had been studying uh, 
Spanish for over 10 years on and off, kind of intermittently. And the last few years had just been on Duolingo. Um, but when I just started getting into like learning techniques for language learning, I started reading Maze Runner in Spanish. And by this time I had, I had developed a pretty good level in Spanish because I was living in El Salvador at the time. And actually, let's see here. This is actually the second Maze Runner book. Do I have the first one? Well, I bought the first one um, while I was in El Salvador, and I had been reading it a lot. And at first, I like I developed this system where um, when I would oh, actually, I think I did it with Game of Thrones. Yeah, let me see here. Yeah, so. If I can find any passages here. Yeah, so I had been reading Game of Thrones in Spanish. And if you can see, I would, when I would come across a word I didn't know, I would underline it, and then I would write the de definition next to it. Um, and I did that a lot, you can see. Uh, now granted, Game of Thrones is pretty deep, and so, even though there's a lot of underlined words here, that's still probably only like half or less than half of the words that I didn't know. Um, just didn't end up being really a great system because why am I writing the definitions of the words in here? I'm not planning on going back and reading it again. This book is too long to read a bunch of times. Um, I guess it... Kind of, so this was sort of an intensive reading exercise. Um, for those who were watching this stream earlier, um, we talked about intensive reading versus extensive reading. Uh, this was intensive, right? Like I'm stopping my reading to go look up words and the definitions and to actually learn definitions. I'm actually studying the language rather than just reading for pleasure. Um, probably helped a little bit but just wasn't, wasn't great. All right, David says, hey man, glad I managed to make it to the live session. I wanted to ask how your Portuguese is going. I remember you saying you wanted to learn it. Yeah, right. So um, that was back in June. Um, and I don't know, I guess you must've watched the video where I was talking about this. So. Uh, I had been walking the Camino de Santiago, which was an amazing experience, and I would recommend it to anyone. Walking through Spain, uh, you know, brushing up on my Spanish, because it had been a few years since I lived in a Spanish-speaking country. Um, that was going pretty well. And then at the very end, you know, I was walking all the way across Spain, just 100% to the other side. I actually, I, I, made, I walked all the way from France all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. So literally 100% of the country I walked across. And then I'm almost in Portugal, so I thought I'll go to Portugal afterwards. Um, so probably like two weeks before getting to Portugal, I decided I was gonna start learning uh, Portuguese on Duolingo. And not only that, but I had been walking with some Brazilians, so that was fun too. Um, it was my for first time ever being to a Portuguese speaking country. Um, and um, my goal was never to learn Portuguese really well. Okay, so this goes back to what I was saying earlier about Moses, Moses McCormick, right? He just, he's a language freak. He just loves languages. He's learning like 30 or 50 of them. Of course, he's not learning these languages really well. And so that was kind of my thinking with Portuguese. Uh, I wanted to learn Portuguese enough to the point where I could say some basic stuff to people in Portugal. And my thought was, well, Portuguese and Spanish are so close that maybe with just a few weeks of learning Portuguese, I can actually have real conversations with people in Portuguese. And I was able to have like very basic conversations with people in Portuguese. You know, we would walk with these people, or I would walk, you know, uh, 
there was multiple individuals actually from, from Brazil who came to Spain to do the Camino. And so I walked with them for a while and they would just teach me things in Portuguese as we went. And it was fun. You know, um, then I went to Portugal, I spent like a weekend there or something and it was a good time. And that was just the end of it. Um, let me see. Can I remember any of the Portuguese? I remember, um, o meu nome é. And I remember, uh, uh, how do you say, it? is it, como você está? Is that, how, how are you? Um, what are some other things I learned in Portuguese? Obrigado, de nada, boa tarde, right? Uh, bom dia, um, you know, all your, all your, your basic phrases. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm glad I did it. And I still remember some Portuguese. It's funny, like, muito legal, muito, muito. Yeah, and I, yeah, they taught me how to say muito, muito bom. Um, and so I'm glad. I'm glad I learned Portuguese. And it's funny because I run into Brazilians not often, but like, Every time I do, I, I want to learn more Portuguese. I say, eu quero aprender falar português. Um, and I would say at least once a year, I run into a Portuguese person that, uh, that teaches me a little bit of Portuguese. <laughs> so this is a very slow process. Um, and yeah, it was good. It was a good experience for like, yeah, normally my Portuguese lessons last for about uh, two hours per year, right? On, on the rare occasion that I meet a, a, a Brazilian. And this time it lasted for about two weeks or so. And, and then I spent some time in Portugal. So it was fun. It's a good experience. But yeah, again, my goal was never to become a master of Portuguese. And I'm not actively working on it anymore. Um, I will, I guess, if I meet another Brazilian sometime soon, but I was just talking with Brazilians in, in the summer, so I'm not due to meet another Brazilian until next summer, I guess, because that's on average, that's how often I, I, I meet Brazilians. All right, uh, I'm guilty of looking for ways to learn languages instead of actually learning them too. I think it's because we humans unconsciously always want to find easier way to do things. Yeah, and I wouldn't say you're guilty of that, um, it's important to, to find new ways of, of learning languages and, and, you know, trying to find more efficient ways of learning now. Um, but I do, I do see what you're saying though, because the more time you spend learning about a subject is less time that you spend applying it. And, um, this um, this became really salient to me about five years ago. I, I decided I wanted to get into photography. I had, um, well, and I did for actually, you know, I bought a lot of nice camera equipment and I had been getting into it for a while and, uh, and did a few jobs, uh, doing photography and videography and stuff. Um, and I, what I realized is that, so I was just teaching myself though, right? I, I, I never, I didn't go to school for this or anything. It was just something fun that I wanted to do in photography. <clears throat> and um, what I realized is that since I was teaching myself how to do photography, I was spending all my time on YouTube or reading blogs or listening to podcasts about how to do photography. And what I wasn't doing was going out into the world and taking pictures or taking videos. And so there is a danger of spending all your time learning how to do something that you never practice it. And you need both. Well, the practice is how you learn, but uh, you need to learn how to learn uh, because if you're using the wrong language learning techniques like me when I was trying to learn Greek, then you're just gonna fail. Uh, learning is not gonna really take place. So both are important and you, you do have to figure out how to moderate that. Um, okay. <clears throat> but the harsh truth is that there 
is no easy way. It's all about the effort. There's no shortcut. There are, well, there are shortcuts, though. I don't agree with that. You know, there's things that you can do to make things more efficient. Now, I guess it depends what you mean by shortcut, because there's no, there's no way to make language learning truly easy. Like, it, it takes work. It does take work. But you can apply that work in, in ways that make it more efficient. Right? Um, it's not all language learning is the same. If you're on Duolingo all the time, you can put in the same amount of effort on other language learning websites or programs and get more, more, um, I don't know what you'd say, more fruit out of it. All right, don't you think Spanish and Portuguese are practically two different dialects of the same language? No. They're very close. Well, <clears throat> I should take that back. They're in, in linguistics, there is no clear-cut, agreed-upon difference between a dialect and a language, okay? And this becomes really salient in, like, parts of Africa or in different areas, maybe in Asia, where they have what you call dialect continuums, meaning that you have people in one village that speak a language, then you have people in the next village over that speak the same language, but it's a little bit different. They have an accent. They have some strange things. Then you have people in the next village over who speak an even di more different version of that, that accent. Um, and then you keep going one village over. And then you're t you know you got 10 villages all in a row where these people speak a language. And these people speak the same language. And these people speak the same language. But you're, just, you're getting more and more different as you go along. So you get to the point where the people at the end here can understand the people in this village and they can understand the people in this village and even these two can understand each other a little bit but the two villages <laughs> this is a really intense example i know the the people in the two villages at the end of this spectrum can't understand each other so does that mean they speak two different languages another example of this is the scots language or the scots dialect whatever you want to call it when i listen to someone speak scots I cannot understand what they're saying, but someone from Scotland can understand what they're saying, even though we both speak English. And probably someone from Northern England, I don't know, but I assume probably someone from Northern England can understand speakers of Scots better than I can, but they probably go all the way. Um, so it's it's a continuum and there's no clear cut area where you would say this is definitively a new language as opposed to just being a dialect of the same language it's muddy it's it's hard to define so no i wouldn't say spanish and portuguese are practically two dialects of the same language for one because a lot of time spanish speakers have trouble understanding what Portuguese speakers speakers are saying. It's easier with written words, um, but these two languages are, are are different enough that I would call them different languages, not just dialects of the same language. <clears throat> do, 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 do. Okay, uh, you have to come to Argentina, Provincia de Buenos Aires. One dollar equivale a 40 pesos argentinos. Nobody speak English. I would love to go to Buenos Aires someday. I had been to, um, that was a really fun comment, by the way. It started in English and then somewhere along the line turned into Spanish and then back to English again. Um, <clears throat> I've been to Uruguay, to Montevideo. That was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it there. So I, I'd love to go to, to Uruguay some. Uh, Buenos Aires someday. Um, do, 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 do pretty good. Um, somebody half jokingly said Italian minus French equals Spanish. <laughs> That's I can totally see that. <clears throat> okay, Bosos means Tu eres in Spanish Rio Platense means. 
Is that an English word or a Spanish word? Because I'm not familiar with that word in Spanish, and it doesn't look like a Spanish word. Vosos mans? <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to have you clarify that. Tu eres in Spanish Rio Platense. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, that's the end of the comment section once again. Probably going to wrap up this video here sometime soon. <clears throat> this means significa. Oh. Okay, so that was another English slash Spanish. That was another Spanglish. I still don't understand. I know what sos means. I lived in El Salvador where you don't you don't say you don't say eres to your friends, you say sos. So I'm familiar with that. And also I had been to Uruguay. Um I still don't understand. Oh, sos. oh okay, now I understand what you were saying. Were you talking to someone else? Okay, I see. Vos sos means tu eres in Spanish Rio Platense. I thought, okay, I thought you were literally talking to me when you said vos sos, and then it made no sense when I said vos sos means. How am I means? I just, my, my brain wasn't working there. So, um, I guess we've kind of we've kind of covered all the topics I wanted to talk about as far as input. So with that said, uh, I guess I'm going to log off here. So thanks for watching the video. Um, I'm probably going to be doing live streamings, live streamings. I'm probably going to be doing live streams. Or, no, sorry. And by the way, it wasn't your English that was wrong. You, you, you said that completely right in English. I just didn't understand what you were saying because I was messed up. Yeah, cool. Good night, sweet prince. That's an interesting farewell. Um, yeah, so I, I'm going to try to do live streams on Fridays. Uh, that's my new goal. Next Friday, I'm going to be camping. So next Friday will just be a, a pre-made video. Um, but two Fridays from now should be another... Uh, should be another live stream. Maybe I'll do another live stream this week. I don't know. I guess keep your eyes out for a live stream sometime coming this week if I get a little bit of time where I'm free to do a live stream. All right. Thanks all for watching the video. Uh, and we'll see you sometime eventually.